song is built upon a verse, a story in the New Testament that you're probably familiar with. Peter goes out of a boat and starts walking on water. And this morning, actually, in some of my preparation, came across an illustration about the fact that we have boats, and the boats keep us safe from the storm as long as the water doesn't get in. But that's kind of the trick, isn't it? Sometimes the water gets in and our doubts start building up and we wonder, okay, God, what is going on right now? I really don't like the place my life is at. I'm not sure I understand or know who you are. And this morning what we're talking about and what we'll be talking about for the next four weeks is looking very closely at a beloved, not really text, not a biblical text per se, but a writing that is very sacred. And it's called the Heidelberg Catechism. And we're going to take four weeks and we're going to look bit by bit at that first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism. And so this morning, we'll look at that. And let's go right to that text a minute here and let me just read it for you. The question goes like this. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer says this, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And it goes on from there, but we're looking just at this part this morning. And so as we think this morning about this reality, it is curious, I would say, that the word that the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism chose to define scripture is the word comfort. Now we think a lot about comfort. We like to be comfortable. We like to have comfortable clothes. We like to lay in a comfortable bed. We like to have comfortable chairs. And in fact, I experience in my lifetime a lot of tension in my back. How many of you experience tension in your back and muscles at times, you get sore, right? Not many of you. All of, oh, okay, because, oh, wait, more people, okay. I, that's too bad because I was going to say, those of you who have tension are invited over to my house. Now, you may think that's curious. Why would I invite you over to my house? So you could receive more tension? No. So I thought a while ago, you know, I wonder what I could find a used massage chair for on Kijiji. I wonder how much that would cause. And here's my problem, a confession moment. I should not look on Kijiji, <laughs> period, right? I think I've confessed this to you before, but I, I just should not look on Kijiji because inevitably what happens, if you look long enough and you look hard enough, you will find some deal that is too good that even though you should pass it up, you don't pass it up. So. I present to you my massage chair. That is my beast of a massage chair. And we found this on Kijiji, and we drove to Toronto. It was actually on Labor Day weekend. And we drove to Toronto, and the lady had four kids in a two-bedroom apartment, a king-size bed with two dressers, and this massage chair in the bedroom. You can imagine why she wanted it out. So, thankfully, my son is six foot four and a half and about 190 pounds, and I thought, let's go and we can move this massage chair. Well, this massage chair weighs 237 pounds. It's a beast, and it's ugly. You know, I brought it home, and the plan was to bring it upstairs in the bedroom where nobody would see it, but it's too heavy. So we've left it downstairs, and, and, and it's been a point of interest for many people, and here's the, the thing that's interesting. I mean, is, while it's ugly, the people who come over love to sit in it. I mean, those, those, those legs, I don't know if you can see it too carefully, but those actually like massage your feet and, and rub your calves. And, you know, you sit in that chair and, and it makes you comfortable. When I'm hurting, I go home, I sit in that chair, and it feels pretty good. When you're hurting... What do you do? Think back to the last time you were really hurting or stressful. What did you do? Where did you turn? 
So our catechism says that really the only true comfort we can have in life and in death is that we belong to Jesus. And that comes from some of these different texts. I want you to see that the catechism helps us understand scripture. And it helps us to look and see what does, you know, how can we understand the truths about Christianity? And so 1 Corinthians 6 says this, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? And then what does it say? Read those words with me. You are not your own. So we have some good biblical foundation in our catechism. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And then Romans 14 says this, for none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So read this together with me. So, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And then finally, Titus 2 verse 14. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. What I want to do with you this morning is first of all start and look at two misunderstandings that affect our ability to receive God's comfort. How we've grown up, how we've experienced what our thoughts are about God need to be clearly biblical. And that's what the catechism was established for, to say you need to clearly understand the truth about God. And so we're going to look at two misunderstandings, and then we will look at two steps we will take. Timothy Keller, as a Presbyterian preacher in New York City, and he helped uh, frame this conversation for me this morning. One of the things he said is that many people who are against Christianity. Those people who say, you know, I don't want anything to do with the church. I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Uh, Those people, whatever, whatever their experience is, he has found that many people who are against Christianity have a wrong understanding about what Christianity really is. And as we reflect this morning, I recognize that in my own life, I went through a time where I had a wrong misunderstanding of what Christianity was as well. I've shared this with you previously, but I'll share it with you again. I was in my third year of seminary in 1998, and my body was shutting down, and I was very sick and depressed. And while continuing to go daily to seminary classes and to do biblical assignments, in my mind and in my heart, I felt that either there was no God or that God hated me. Two very wrong and inaccurate thoughts about God. And yet those were what I held and believed. Thankfully, I only stayed in that place for a few months because when you have the idea or the belief that there is no God or that if there is a God, he hates you, then do you know what is missing from your life? Any resemblance of hope. There was no hope in that place. It was just dark. And my life was already dark, so to to completely turn off the lights with thinking that way left me in a place that was too scary. And so I came back. Now, why do I share that with you this morning? Because of this. I want you to open yourself up for the next 10 or 15 minutes that you may have a slightly or maybe even significantly inaccurate idea about who God is or what Christianity is about, or why the cross and why Jesus is so important. Will you do that with me? Just open yourself up to say, it's possible. I may be emphasizing one of these two extremes. And so what I want to give to you are two uh, realities of Scripture that though they seem opposed, can be held together and joined together. The first is this. We may have the misunderstanding that would affect our ability to receive comfort that God is a relativistic or a 
teddy bear God. Allow me to explain that for a moment. Those with this kind of image want to have a God that is cuddly, soft, warm, loving, compassionate, always welcoming. People with the idea of a relativistic Christianity don't like the texts in scripture that talk about the judgment or the wrath or the anger of God. And in fact, they don't really like the cross either because the cross is is a little bit gruesome. It's a little bit hard to explain how a loving, compassionate teddy bear God would sacrifice his own son on a cross in that way. And so those with the teddy bear God want everyone to be loving and warm and friendly. Now, these are good things. I think that's what we're called to do, and and they're very biblical. But here's the problem. If we emphasize that idea of Christianity, and we downplay the following reality, and that is this. God is holy. God is a just God. And as a holy and just God, God cannot be around sin. A couple of weeks ago, I was reading just through Genesis, uh, you know, started my reading plan again. So actually, it would have been the first week of January. So uh, reading through the old, reading through scripture, and I hope you're on a reading plan. I hope you're reading regularly. And, and I read, you know, a text that you've read a million times, Genesis 3. But it struck me a different way because this time when I was reading it, I talked about Adam and Eve and their disobedience and and they took the bite and then they hid. And then the, the translation I was reading said, in the cool of the day, in the cool of the day, God went walking. So later in the day, later in the afternoon, God is walking. And what happens? Adam and Eve know that God is walking and they know they've broken covenant. They know they've broken their relationship with God, and so they're hiding. And they've covered themselves because they feel shame. And in that moment, this was the reality that came to me. You know, God doesn't really care what our sin is, what the extent or how we grade it is, because any sin, any disobedience separates us from him. That's what God hates. That's what God hates is being separated from those people that he made and desires to be in relationship with. And so when we sin and we disobey, we put walls, barriers between not only us and God, but between us and others as well. That's why scripture says, you know, it's so important to confess your sins one to another. That's why we start and we say, you know, the thing that we hold in common is that we're all broken, messed up sinners. And when we start there and we come together and we say, you know what? Oh, we're so broken, so messed up. You know, we need God in our life. I've I've talked before, and I think it's a wonderful image and idea that a church would look like an AA meeting. Let me tell you why. Because an AA meeting starts with this. We admitted we were powerless over, you fill in your own blank. Okay? Take a moment. Fill in your own blank. We admitted that we were powerless, that our lives had become unmanageable. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. When we start in that kind of place, And we say, okay, God, we know that you are holy and just. And because we are broken sinners, we can't be in communion relationship with you on our own. That's the relativistic reality. Second is a moralistic God. This is an image of a moralistic God. I thought you would laugh. Okay. An angry judge an angry judge that says, you know what, we grew up and we think God is just. He hates sin. He barely tolerates people. God is to be feared. 
And he's going to pour out his wrath. All through the Old Testament, he's pouring out his wrath and his anger. And you better be careful or God's going to smite you or curse you or crush you. And in fact, you know, it's interesting that these signs get, I believe, translated in subtle ways. Subtle ways. When I was a kid, if I didn't sit still during church, if I wiggled too much or made too much noise, yes. <laughs> hey, how many of you ever experienced that? And I understand there, there was a, there was a, there's a meaning and a significance of saying, you know, we want to be reverent. But the image and the idea and the impression that gave to children is that God is to be feared. And if you mess around during Sunday morning, your parents are going to be feared as well. And so our appearance, our attendance, and our behavior became the important things to say that's what a good Christian looks like a moralistic perspective of Christianity says that you better look right, be in the right place, and act the right way. And if you fell out of that, then you were in trouble. And that's common. I believe that many of us sitting here this morning grew up more affected and more leaning towards a moralistic perspective of God than of a relativistic perspective. And here is what we need to understand. It's that both of these things, though they may seem like opposite, can be held together and understood together, but only with understanding the importance of the cross. Listen to this quote from Timothy Keller. The cross is the only spot in any religion that shows us on the one hand that God is so utterly and completely and relentlessly and absolutely and infallibly holy that he has to pour out wrath and to find justice on evil and sin and at the very same time the cross shows us a God who is so absolutely and completely and utterly and relentlessly and perfectly and infallibly loving that he would do it on his own son rather than lose us. Let that permeate you for a moment. A God that is so relentlessly holy and just and yet so perfectly loving that he would pour out his wrath on his son, rather than lose any one of us. People of God, when we hold that reality together, do you know what it gives us? Comfort. It gives us comfort because we recognize, one, it's not about us. It's not about whether you're perfect enough whether you've done enough, whether the sin that you've wrestled with, you've wrestled with it for too long, whether the brokenness in your past is too deep, it comes to the realization that says no matter what perspective you come from, relativistic or moralistic, whether you thought you didn't need to have any righteousness or whether you thought you could earn the righteousness on your own, that they come together at the cross and we recognize that it is only through Jesus. It is only through Jesus that we can be and experience the comfort that God desires us to have. And so two steps. Two steps we have to take. First is this. Probably the most striking word in the beginning of that catechism. What is your only your only comfort. We can know and I could elaborate and you can look around and you've experienced trying to find comforts in all sorts of different ways and the ways that we've tried are as different as the many faces as I see here this morning, that we've sought comfort. But the catechism in the Bible teaches us that it needs to be our only comfort. 
And I thought of that from this perspective. If it's your only comfort, do you want to know something? Nothing else matters. What did you come to church this morning? What burden were you bearing? What weight were you carrying on your own as you walked through these doors this morning? Because the word of the gospel truth for you this morning is that it doesn't matter. Really, it doesn't matter. That may seem strange, but it's true. It doesn't matter. Why? Because your only comfort, the only thing that matters is that you and I are not our own, but we belong to Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that matters. The second piece about that that you need to hear this morning as well, and I find it interesting in a faith tradition of the Reformed Church that we stand in, one in which the sovereignty and the power of God is so emphasized that we baptize our babies to acknowledge that God is moving and active even before they are aware of his purpose and plan for their life. In a tradition where God is sovereign, that the response starts with what? I. I. That's almost Armenian, meaning that we emphasize the response that God has. But here's what it's saying, is that each and every single one of us we have to make that decision for ourselves, don't we? We are invited to willingly surrender our own understanding about comfort and about righteousness and about God that we say we will willingly surrender that to the Lord, that I, that I am not my own, but I willingly give myself up to the Lord who created and made and redeemed me. That, people of the Lord, leads to a life of comfort, deep and abiding comfort. And it's my prayer that each one of you are living within that comfort or that the experience you are in right now will lead you even more deeply into that truth. Let's pray. Lord, it is good to come together and to recognize that we don't need to worry about ourselves. Recognizing that our only comfort in life and in death is found in Jesus Christ allows us to, first of all, give up ideas about ourselves. Some of us are working harder than gerbils on an exercise wheel in a cage to, to give ourselves esteem to give ourselves worth. And it's exhausting. Lord, that we would give up the idea of ourself that we need to do or accomplish or be something on our own. Lord, when we give that up, then we recognize that whatever the future holds, it's okay. Whatever is going to happen or whatever is happening. It's not in our control, even though sometimes we want to think that it is. It's not in our control, and that's actually a good thing because it's in the hands of a loving Father who cares so deeply for us that even though sin separated us, he sent his Son to die for us to restore that relationship. And then, Lord, it changes how we see every day. When we recognize that, we have been given this gift, this gift of eternal life, but also of joy, peace, perseverance, patience, kindness, understanding, self-control, all these things, Lord, that we sometimes feel so lacking in. And your spirit says, here, here it is. I give it to you. As a daughter of the Lord, As a son and a brother of Jesus Christ, here you go. Enjoy, celebrate God's goodness. And so, Lord, may we, as we walk forward from this place, 
for each day of the rest of our lives know that our only comfort in life and in death is in our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we do not belong to ourselves, but we belong to him. Amen.